The following Pharma Essentia podcast is intended for informational and educational purposes only and cannot be considered as medical advice. Please speak to a healthcare professional before making any treatment decisions. Hey, Josh. Hey, Kay. And hello, listeners. And watchers. Welcome back to the PV Pod Stories from the Marrow, a podcast about polycythemia vera. Brought to you by Pharma Essentia. Thanks, Pharma Essentia. Okay, do you know what makes a great artist, a great creator, a great team member, just an overall pillar of the community? I would say maybe integrity or an open mind. Oh, please don't be ridiculous. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) It takes more than just gusto to be truly great at your craft. It's not something you can simply do in isolation. No, no, okay. I'll tell you, the secret superpower behind all of us is obviously our managers. Our managers. Yes, the backbone of the team, the brain of the body, the conventionally attractive one. Are you saying this because you're my manager? That has absolutely nothing to do with this. Okay, so what does it have to do with the episode? Don't rush me. Okay, look, we agree that a great manager is the secret behind a great employee. Do we? Yes. And what's the secret skill that every great manager has? I feel like these questions are rhetorical. A great manager is really good at managing things. Yes, I can't argue with that. And today on the PV Pod, we are talking about managing PV in the long term. Okay, this is all making sense now. Okay, as your manager, I think I should take the lead on this one, given all the experience I have managing you. By all means. Actually, you know what? Yeah, I'm looking forward to this one. We've talked about it a bit in previous episodes, but it's actually a perfect topic to dig into further. We know living with PV is a journey, one that can span decades, so it's important to learn how to manage PV as you get older and as your PV changes with age. Patients with PV live decades, and many of them, frankly, have a normal life expectancy. You teed them up so well, Kay. I'm really proud of you, and in turn, I'm proud of me. Man. I'm a great manager. And who are we speaking with today? My name is Saleh Shadid. I'm a hematologist and medical oncologist. Um, I work with the Singing River Healthcare System down on the Mississippi coast in Gulfport. Hi, Dr. Shadid. In the past, we've really enjoyed how fun and insightful it is to talk with patients, but I do also love our episodes where we get to talk with doctors and experts. I always appreciate the professional perspective on the complicated minutia of PV. It really helps me wrap my brain around the full picture. I couldn't agree more. There are quite a lot of variables to consider when learning about PV, and having access to the patient, caregiver, and medical professional perspectives has been one of the coolest parts about putting together this podcast with UK. To loop us back into the conversation, let's have Dr. Shadid share a little more about his background in hematology and oncology. I've been practicing for 20 years, uh, did my training at MD Anderson, have been in community practice, have worked in academics with the University of Texas Medical Branch in the past, um, and most recently I've been I'm back in community practice. I take care of all types of cancer uh, patients. And, you know, these patients um, oftentimes uh, come with just a simple diagnosis of having high red blood cells. Um, Although sometimes they present with a blood clot, a stroke, heart attack, other things like that. But the majority of patients simply present with um, having high blood count. As we know, polycythemia vera results in an elevated blood count of red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. So it seems like Dr. Shadid is the perfect guy to be on our show. Where do you want to start? Well, we often start patient stories with their initial diagnosis. That early moment can be critical in establishing the relationship between PV and your medical team. We've heard it from the patient side, but now let's look at it from the medical side. We asked Dr. Shadid how he explains a PV diagnosis to patients and whether or not he characterizes it as cancer. In, in truth, it is a type of cancer, although it's a cancer that many people have almost normal life expectancies with. It does cause a number of sort of um, things that can sometimes be quite bothersome to patient. It can cause sometimes burning pain sensation in your hands and feet. Dr. Reeves told us about that in season one, that tingling, burning sensation in your extremities is called erythromyalgia, and it's a common symptom of PV. These patients sometimes might not know what's going on. Um, It can cause an enlarged, sometimes painful spleen in about a third of folks. Um, It can cause just itchy skin in about a third of folks. 
Um, about half of people have like a transient visual disturbance. So they can have almost, it's called an ocular migraine, which can cause transient vision changes in one eye or another, blind spots, floaters, shimmering, that sort of stuff. Sometimes they might even not even realize or associate that with the, the diagnosis of polycythemia vera. I'm always surprised to hear how common some of these symptoms are that can contribute to a later diagnosis in life. We've talked about itchiness after showering, fatigue, and now erythromy... What was it again? Erythromyalgia. And now these transient vision changes. Each one could feel quite subtle on their own and maybe be brushed off in any number of personal explanations we can so often create in our minds. The itchiness could be explained away as dryness, fatigue with not eating healthy enough or not getting enough sleep. The tingling could turn into, I slept wrong. But for many patients, these symptoms start to add up. They start to feel more regular and more intense. And that's where one starts to wonder, something larger at play here. I'm glad to hear that Dr. Shadid is keeping patient comfort at the forefront of his mind. A lot of patients who do have that gut feeling of something more serious being at work in their bodies have felt sometimes dismissed by their doctors. But like Dr. Shadid is saying, the symptoms can become really painful and distressing, even if you can have a regular life expectancy while living with PV. But it can cause some life disrupting and potentially life altering issues. So it can cause increased risk for heart attacks and strokes. Called, um, it can increase your risk for blood clots and such. So those, and it can cause lots of symptoms that can be bothersome to patients. So we're managing the disease to prevent patient symptoms, things that really bother them, and to prevent, uh, you know, heart attacks, strokes, blood clots. We so often hear this story from the patient perspective. I'd love to hear Dr. Shadid's perspective on this first conversation as well. I'm wondering what sort of advice he might give to a newly diagnosed patient. Well, the first thing is, you know, seek medical attention because having high blood counts, I mean, the initial factor is differentiating what's called primary polycythemia, which is technically a cancer, um, versus secondary polycythemia. And secondary polycythemia, and the two can exist at the same time. So secondary polycythemia would be like a gentleman who's on testosterone supplementation, a person who has underlying heart or lung problems, uh, a person who uh, snores a lot at nighttime and has obstructive sleep apnea, um, and there's even some tumors that can cause erythropoietin release. Erythropoietin, if you're curious, is a hormone that plays a role in the production of red blood cells. Hmm. All of those are technically a different disease, and they're called secondary polycythemia, and they need to be addressed in a very different manner than primary polycythemia. Primary polycythemia is where your bone, your bone marrow is on autopilot and producing too, many, too much blood. That's usually characterized by blood counts that are elevated, but in addition to that, you have a genetic mutation. So the, the, your doctor will check for special blood tests, the JAK2 mutation, exon 12. They might even, in very rare circumstances, need to do a bone marrow biopsy um, to confirm or to establish a diagnosis. So by seeking, your, by seeking medical attention early, one, you help mitigate all those symptoms that, we, that, that you can potentially have, you know, fatigue, uh, alteration in vision, stomach ulcers, um, spleen enlargement, and then you can also reduce the risk for blood clots. Uh, blood clots in your arms and legs mean that you usually would need to be on blood thinners for potentially a long time. Heart attacks and strokes can be potentially life altering. So anything we can do to reduce the patient's risk for having these life altering events and sequelae from the disease can can improve their, their quality of life pretty dramatically. We're going to hear more from Dr. Shadid about living with and managing PV in the long term right after this quick break. So you're learning about PV on the PV pod, Stories from the Marrow. Now get ready to take the next steps on your PV journey with What's Next PV, an educational site on everything polycythemia vera. Knowing what's next can help inform the decisions you and your doctor make about the future and is important to your health. What's Next PV can help you understand test results, set goals for the management of your PV, and make a plan to advocate for yourself. Check out www.whatsnextpv.com to learn more. And we're back. Thanks for sticking around. So I'd like to dive back into the idea of managing PV. Dr. Shadid mentioned it briefly in his last answer. We're managing the disease to prevent heart attacks, strokes, blood clots. But I'd like to go a little bit deeper than that. 
what specifically does it mean to manage PV for the long term? Well, there, there are some treatments that have preclinical data that look like you're potentially changing the overall trajectory or reducing the fancy word is called myelofibrosis or alterations in the bone marrow. Also referred to as MF, myelofibrosis means fibrosis or scarring in the bone marrow. Again, these are preclinical data, but um, it's, it's certainly provocative. And everybody else, we're essentially preventing blood clots um, in the majority of these patients, whether they're arterial or whether they're venous. And so even for low-risk patients, we try to keep their blood counts in a normal range. Um, and so these are, these are long-term things that we try to do to, to mitigate risk and to help patients have the, the least symptoms possible. So these patients, one, they have a lot of symptoms sometimes. So itchy skin, changing vision, stomach ulcers, feeling weak and tired, having burning skin, especially, you know, itchy skin, especially after hot showers. That's, you know, they might not necessarily think much of it, but collectively they become kind of very disrupting to some people's lives. It also increases your risk, as I've said, uh, for developing blood clots in your arms, your legs, and your lungs, or potentially having a heart attack or stroke. I mean, those can be really life-altering events. Even if they don't necessarily make you live a shorter life, they can, be, they, they, they can still be life-altering. Um, and so trying to manage those risks for the long term are really, really important. So just to quickly summarize, when we talk about managing PV in the long term, we're talking about reduction of symptoms, things like fatigue and itchy skin, which we've heard about from patients we've interviewed over and over again. In addition to reducing symptoms, managing PV also means reducing the risk for clots. Clots, which can lead to heart attacks or strokes or other thrombotic events. As well as managing your blood count in the long term. Oh, I'd like to hear more about that. Me too. And naturally, we had to ask Dr. Shadid about the short and long-term treatment goals for patients with PV. So in the short term, it's to um, reduce the risk for clots. So um, the first thing is just to manage cardiovascular risk factors, you know, and that's basic, you know, cholesterol, blood pressure, diabetes, lifestyle modifications, all that contributes to managing cardiovascular risk. Baby aspirin can be very helpful as well in terms of, um, or aspirin, I should say, can be very helpful in terms of reducing people's risk. And then there's something called therapeutic phlebotomy. So many people think of phlebotomy as like a lab test where they draw a little tube of blood, but this would be therapeutic phlebotomy where they would remove a lot more blood with the intention of essentially making patients iron deficient to keep the blood counts in the normal range, which is normally defined as less than 45. Dr. Reeves told us about therapeutic phlebotomies in season one. Another Dr. Reeves shout out. Go listen to that episode if you haven't had a chance. It's really helpful. She told us that therapeutic phlebotomies are performed to reduce your hematocrit, which then makes your blood less thick. All right, Kay, enough yapping. Back to Dr. Shadid. Very managerial of you. So in the short term, keeping blood counts uh, close to normal, like I said, managing cardiovascular risk factors, being on aspirin, those are the short term goals. Long-term goals, especially for high-risk patients, entails keeping the, the counts lower by potentially using medications to keep the blood counts um, in the lower range. Those can also be quite helpful for patients where simple um, you know, therapeutic phlebotomies and aspirin are not sufficient. Sometimes if they develop a new blood clot, if they're needing frequent phlebotomies or they're intolerant to th therapeutic phlebotomy, some patients have a great deal of depression when they're getting you know, therapeutic phlebotomies on a regular basis, if their spleen is enlarging, causing pain, discomfort, um, if they're having progressive rise in platelets or white blood cells, or if their, their symptoms are getting worse, itchy skin, night sweats, they're having profound fatigue that's getting worse, all of those collectively can take a person who is low risk and we would potentially start utilizing some sort of additional treatment. It's called, the fancy word is called cytoreductive, but a medicine to keep the blood counts closer to normal to, and to prevent patient symptoms. Blink and you'll miss it, but Dr. Shadid just mentioned a patient being low risk. I'd like to talk more about that because I'm pretty sure it affects how you might manage your PV in the long term. What makes a patient low risk versus high risk? So the standard criteria for low risk versus high risk is, is basically based on two factors. On the patient's age, so less than 60, if you're less than 60 and you haven't had any prior blood clots, no blood clots in your veins, so that would be a blood clot in like your arms or legs or in your lungs, or in your uh, having an arterial clot, such as a uh, heart attack, stroke, that sort of stuff. So if you don't have any of those and you're less than age 60, you're considered low risk. 
if you have if you're over the age of 60 or you've had any prior blood clot uh, previously, then you'd be considered high risk. So Dana, who we talked to in the last episode, might be considered low risk due to her young age. Right. Her doctor called her a pediatric patient because being under 40 and diagnosed with polycythemia vera is so rare. Here's something else I remember from Dana's episode. Due to her low risk status, she was initially put on a wait and see treatment plan, while she actually wanted a more hands on and proactive treatment plan. I wonder what Dr. Shadid has to say about how he handles when patient goals don't necessarily align with the goals of their provider. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, we have to, you know, find out what the patient's wishes are and what their goals of care are. So, you know, most patients want to live longer and at the same time, they want to have a good quality life. So, you know, kind of honing in on exactly what's bothering the patient. So, you know, is it the fatigue? Is it the visual disturbances? Is it the stomach ulcers? Is it the the itchy kind of painful kind of skin? Um, You know, is it the the risk of, you know, developing blood clots and the the long-term complications of those blood clots? So making sure that those are being properly addressed is very important. It's nice to hear from Dr. Shadid that he's keeping the specific goals of his patients in mind as he decides on the best treatment plan for them. Like we've said before, working with your doctor and forming your healthcare team is a collaborative process. You, as a patient, can and should advocate for what you want out of your treatment plan. I'm wondering how Dr. Shadid might handle a patient who is maybe more reluctant to seek treatment. Now, if the patient's wishes are to be left alone, then as a physician, I would want to kind of know why they want that. And I would you know, want to make sure that they're understanding that this is not a trivial disease and that this can be... You know, if you develop a heart attack or a stroke, that could be life altering. Um, And those, you know, have permanent side effects or permanent, not side effects, but permanent effects that can really be, like I said, life altering. And what about someone in Dana's situation where the patient doesn't feel like the treatment plan is proactive enough? Does Dr. Shadid have advice for someone like that? Um, If the provider, on on the other hand, is being somewhat blasé and, you know, kind of just putting you on baby aspirin, but you've got bad symptoms and they're getting worse, then, you know, just reestablishing contact with the provider and letting them know that your symptoms are getting worse. Because that, even in a low-risk individual, that could be an indication why you would need uh, potentially cytoreductive medicines to keep your blood counts under better control and keep your symptoms under better control. If your spleen is getting bigger, that can cause pain in your left flank, or it can cause early fullness um, and just kind of pain and discomfort. So, I mean, this is not a static disease. This, in, in some patients, this gets worse over time. The itchy skin, the night sweats, the, the fatigue that's so severe you can't work, that, that can sometimes get really, really severe in some patients. And so, you know, keeping in contact with your provider and just making sure that, you know, that your disease is being monitored and that if you are having symptoms that are really bothersome to the patient, that, you know, that we're addressing that on an ongoing basis. Ah, I've learned so much. Kay, what an insightful episode. I know. You really managed the heck out of it. (laughs) Didn't I? It is always really helpful to hear things from the doctor's perspective, and I'm grateful we had the opportunity to discuss PV in the long term, since this is a condition most patients will live with and manage for many years. We all know how important it is to manage things. Thank you so much, Dr. Shadid, for your contributions to this episode. And thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We'll see you next time on The PV Pod, Stories from the Marrow. A podcast about polycythemia vera. The PV Pod, Stories from the Marrow, is produced by Believe Limited and Bloodstream Media and made possible thanks to our sponsor, Pharma Essentia. The PV Pod is hosted by me, Kay Vermeil, and my co-host, Josh Bragg. If you like the show, please share it with anyone for whom it might make a difference and leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. We'll see you next time.